So hello, uh, welcome to the 24th edition of Airhex. And uh, shortly before the show, I thought 24th edition of Airhex is something special. And uh, 24th edition, and we have one edition a month. So what it means we're doing this for two years. Uh, I thought this is something like a one year, but already for two years. For that reason, I wanted actually to drink some coffee, but uh, I had no time to do it. So I'm drinking milk and this from the Mac. And what it is, is this happy birthday, Java. It was uh, five years of Java. I got the mark at Sun Microsystem Germany back then. And the funny story was, um, during uh, the event, it was a huge event with a uh, party. There was one attendee who, who, um, who said that um, he has already seven years uh, Java experience uh, during the event. And um, yeah, uh, during uh, five, ye five years of Java birthday event. So this was a short story. So uh, now to breaking news. So um, what you see here, this is nothing because uh, this has to be uploaded. So it will start right after the show, but this is coming soon. So um, this is ready to go. So I wanted to, um, to record a concise um, Java e microservices uh, workshop. What happened instead, um, it is the longest, uh, or, or I don't know whether it is the longest workshop, but it has the most episodes, twice as much as the other, 72 episodes, starts with uh, Java 8 and ends with Docker. So um, I actually uh, uh, had to, to, um, to remove some stuff from there. So it could be even a second part. So um, if I manage to uh, create the titles and upload this, it should be online this or next week. But this is just for you, for the, um, for the, uh, for the AirHacks watchers. Keep it secret so far. <laughs> so um, this was that. Then uh, the next question is, um, I, I get a question actually, uh, I, I got it asked uh, this uh, today three times. Um, the, um, the workshops, um, whether they are open seats for April, yes, they are. What's strange is uh, we are far more attendees uh, in, in the July and summer than April. I have to work on my marketing skills. And this is a nice group. I think we have around uh, 10 people a day, which is the smallest uh, crowd so far, uh, which is nice. So you can ask me even more questions. But at one point of time, we'll book a room. And then the seats will be extremely limited because um, right now we can still scale, uh, still the largest uh, room at the um, airport. But um, if we commit it to smaller room, then it, the, the seats are going to be extremely uh, limited. So this is the uh, story about um, April's um, April um, air hacks. As always, you can ask me questions on Twitter or uh, the IRC. So you can use the um, Vimeo IRC or at Freenode with hashtag airhacks. And let's see. So there is... Um Ah, use a J something. <laughs> All threads started correctly, so perfect. So um, no questions here, no questions here. And there is one nice user who said something. So this chat is already busy, busier than Twitter, of course. So, so we have this. Now, news from Java e community. Let's start with some drama. So first, Riza Rahman, uh, one of the, uh, I would say, the absolute gurus of Java E, left Oracle. He was a Java E evangelist, and I have to say, he is a really straight one. So um, he's really, really honest guy, and he truly believes in Java E. And uh, he left Oracle, and why? Read his blog. So this is, um, I think, uh, he posted this uh, on March fourth. So this is really hot news. And now he is freelancer, is my understanding. So I get lots of questions to know, do you know any Java E developers? Now I know one, <laughs> Riza Rahman. So um, if you uh, need uh, support uh, in your Java E projects, ask him. I think he could have some time, but he's now extremely busy, busy in pushing Java E 8 forward. So I don't even know whether, <laughs> whether uh, he has some time or not. But um, yeah, read the story, interesting one. Um, on that note, uh, another... Um, Interesting blog post is from um, uh, from uh, John Klingen. He is he was the I think product manager of Glassfish, uh, and now he's working for Red Hat. He's also PM I think even for for Whitefly Whitefly Swarm. I don't know it for sure, but I know he works for for Red Hat. And um, and uh, someone wrote a blog post. I get also several links to Java is dead. Stop using it. And uh, post removed then. And um, and he wrote some um, interesting um, 
uh, from his point of view, he, he wrote the story. And I got lots of tweets about Java is dying, Java is dead. And I usually ignore them completely. Why? Because um, I started in Java with uh, 1995. And, and I think the first time what I heard Java is, was going to be dying, dying is during the party because uh, everyone said Java is too slow and, and C rules. And um, the next time which was Java really supposed to die was because of Ruby on Rails I, um, I, uh, or Java E. Um, I remember a, it exactly in 2006 and there was huge drama because um, Sun back then uh, supported Rails even in NetBeans and everywhere and everyone was, uh, there was a, uh, some, you know, some excitement in the air. And, uh, and now I hear it again, uh, what's true is, um, after Java Java One, uh, the um, Oracle is really quiet regarding to 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 Java E8, which is remarkable, and um, and uh, from my point of view, um, the, the, the go to the first topic. Um, so is Java E dying? Um, the question is um, oh, typo here. We'll correct it tomorrow. So um, what um, what what I ask myself. What should happen, or what 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 could kill Java? And um, if you looked right now at the specs, it seems to me like the huge amount of of, of work is usually done by the community. If you look at the CDI, this is you know uh, uh, the uh, Red Hats and the Apaches are working like crazy. This is one of the busiest spec. Eclipse Link, uh, or sorry, Eclipse Link JPA. It was uh, Red Hat and and Eclipse Link guys, so Oracle or, or um, um, uh, Eclipse Link guys, and uh, and Hibernate uh, guys. And um, if you look at Java 8 security, for instance, there's Aryan teams from Z. He, he's like he's working like crazy. Um, I don't know how how he can achieve this, but um, he, he 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 cranks prototypes and and does lots of the work. So um, the question is, what could kill Java E? And um, it is hard to imagine because if um, JCP becomes unresponsive, what um, what uh, you could do, you could take over the um, the uh, JSR according to the JCP. So it's a formal process. So um, w what could happen? So what sh should happen first? So I think Oracle, Oracle, IBM, Red Hat should stop working on Java E. Then the community should just would would have to ignore it completely. And then it would, in one point of time, it would die. But it is a lot of investment, and there are actually more and more projects in Java E. It means the whole industry will have to ignore it as well. So this should happen. And um, even if, let's say, Java E8 would come two years later than supposed, I have to say I'm using just a subset of Java E7 and probably Java E6, and I am probably happy. And the huge boost was Java 8. I'm really looking to Java 9. So uh, for me, it wouldn't even die if it would come two years later. But I know, you know, there's less excitement and everyone uh, is exciting about new features. But from the enterprise perspective, I don't know what could kill Java E. So, um, but still, we are really interested in having, of course, Java E8. And I'm um, exciting about uh, management, monitoring, and these features. So uh, we should push it forward. But I think we as community, we should uh, just push Java E8 uh, forward, regardless what uh, Oracle, IBM, or on, on whatever company is doing, because um, yeah, because it's our job to do this. And just writing posts that uh, Java E is dying and we should stop using it. Um, yeah, of course we could write a post, but instead of um, writing a post, I would rather issue some tickets <laughs> in Java 8 and try to improve the world because. Uh, um, yeah, uh, just writing something that is dying is uh, stupid, right? So uh, if it's dead, why write about it? So, um, so this is what I don't like, the whole drama. So speaking of, um, of uh, community news and tickets, so I actually created a lot of tickets and um, I would like to present you in the hope you will um, upvote these because I would really like to have them in Java 8. And if there is nothing happens, what I would like to do is to try to contribute some code, involve community you. So if you like to contribute, just ping me. And uh, if nothing happens, what we can do, we can take over the spec or whatever. But I would really like to have the functionality. And the first one is... The, um, there is a transactional annotation and we had some chat with Linda de Michael and she was absolutely right. So my first idea was to have uh, the transaction attribute 
attribute, yeah, trans uh, how it's called? Uh, transaction attribute, I think, from EJB uh, extend with timeout. And, and she was absolutely right. She said, okay, but I uh, you know um, this is an old um, old uh, annotation. We introduced something new, Yavex transactional. We could extend that. And this is actually a good point. So what I did, I uh, I I raised an issue for for the spec at 25th of February, and I would really like to have the transactional annotation to be extended with um, with timeout. And there are already some um, some um, uh, some comments, so read them. And um, if you like, votes for it. This would be really nice. Write a post about this and escalate the issue. This would be really nice. So this is what I would like to have. Then what you will get, we could specify per method the transaction timeout. Right now is not possible with uh, with standard features. And you, as you probably know me, I really like standard features. I don't like to bother with vendor specific stuff. Okay. Then uh, the next one is from uh, from uh, Jaxres. And what I would like to have is programmatic resource discovery. So it's something like metadata API in JaxOS that I go to the JaxOS service and say, hey, give me all resources. Uh, right now, we would have to use CDI and extensions and whatever, but um, the, the container already knows uh, what is deployed, so it should be really easy. Why I would like to do this? Because then it would be fairly easy to implement in you know, a registry or, or, or plugin mechanism. I don't need it in all my projects, but sometimes really, really handy to have it. And Jersey has it already. I think it's called Model Maker or something. So it's already available in Jersey. Uh, not Model Maker. What was it? Um, model something. So um, in Jersey. So this was the EGB spec. This was my first issue. It is resolved because we move it to the to the other one. The next one I really would like to uh, to ha have upvoted, and it is um, um, max pool size. So I would like to extend the EJB um, with standard uh, max pool size annotation. Why that? Because it does really convenient way to implement throttling. Because um, the semantics are as follows: there can be never more then uh, one thread per EJB. So if we restrict the amount of, of instances, um, so uh, we can re restrict also the amount of parallel threads. And this is really convenient per boundary. So it really fits my boundary control entity model. And yeah, this is this what, um, um, what I propose. And um, or optionally, what we could do uh, in CDI, we could introduce in CDI pooled annotation um, and then we, we could kill EJBs basically because if it's pulled and monitored, we don't need EJBs anymore. So one of so either we extend EJBs or we extend uh, CDI, but uh, but but pooling is not only good for performance. And there is another uh, interesting part. There uh, there were some some performance. This was another drama <laughs> in the internet. Um, um, I. Um, um, I published the uh, course Effective Java E, and uh, what I did then, uh, I, I, I compared the performance just as, as um, introduction of GM, GMH, Java, uh, uh, how it's called, um, performance harness, and micro benchmark harness. And um, so I, um, I showed how to use it. And for this purpose, I, I compared CDI and EGB performance. And, and what, what happened, it turned out that EGBs are faster than CDI. And someone in the internet um, actually um, interviewed, uh, not someone, this was, I think, uh, Pavel Block. Let's see. Um, this was not this one. There was an interview uh, with, where is it? This is the interview and the um, the uh, Pavel exactly, and he wrote a um, an, an a benchmark, a really nice one, uh, and is on GitHub open source and compared EJBs with CDI in Spring, and um, and what happened was that uh, EJB won <laughs> won the performance benchmark. Why I'm laughing? Um, because uh, because I know some projects who uh, who with huge effort they get rid of EGBs because of performance and they created their own framework which was a lot slower than EGBs. This is uh, somehow funny for me. Um, okay, where, where is he? Um, this was I think exactly. This was the course effective Java E, but somewhere here, um, somewhere here is he is his benchmark. Is this one? No. 
So uh, read the interview, really amazing one. It's the interview about uh, running Java on, 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 on mainframes and then about the performance. Okay, so um, we covered that. So the next is, um, what I would like to have is the inject rest is another issue. I would like to have standardized connection timeout and, and read timeout. So right now it is, um, it's, um, it's uh, not standardized. So you will have to use the jersey or, or rest easy properties. But I, I need this all that all the time because if two wars have to communicate with each other, I use JAXRS and I have to specify it over and over again. What I usually do use, I use the strings, but this is really messy. And I think connection timeout, it will be really easy or how it's called low hanging fruit to standardize this. So um, please vote for this. So I, I would expect after the show around 100 votes here. Okay. So, and the last one, the others are older. Is what I would like to have is um, an, an possibility to pass to the JAXRS client an executor service. And what you could do then is you could, for instance, pass the managed executor service from application server or even Porcupine. And uh, what you get then is, uh, yeah, you get uh, managed threads uh, used by a JAXRS client and you could restrict the um, amount of parallel behavior uh, using a standard facility like the managed executor service. Okay. Um, there is all uh, another uh, great news. I was at uh, J Focus, and at J Focus, I met I met uh, Greg Luck from Jcash, and we have a conversation. And what happens now is uh, there will be a uh, a integration between Jcash and Java 8. Um, so they will working on this, and we are also working on a prototype. I will post um, 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 I, I, a blog post about this. So there are several people already working, and also Arian contributed, and Johan Foss, and uh, uh, we have some ideas. So there will be a Jcash integrated in Java 8. Um, okay, so, um, and um, what also happened at JFocus, I delivered a talk, I think, Javaistic uh, way of coding. And what I showed is uh, nothing new to you. It's just, you know, how to d implement uh, Java e apps. And um, I also played a little bit with Docker and showed why Docker fits perfectly with Java e. So um, if you are interested, um, check out the, um, there was, where is it? The talk here, the Javaistic way of coding from JFocus. Funny enough, I got the strangest screenshot ever here with Google. I don't know why, but uh, all others are reasonable, but this one is strange. Okay, so if you're interested in uh, Java e hacking and Docker, look at the uh, JFocus talk. And also funny story, this was the last talk and I actually officially had 45 minutes, but, um, and uh, after my talk, there was a party because JFocus, I think was 10 years old. And uh, the attendees have so many questions that um, um, my talk was half hour longer than actually supposed, and we have great chats uh, chat afterwards. So thank you if you attended JFocus. Thank you for the questions, and it was really fun uh, to talk with you. And you know who cares about parties if you can have Java? E. Okay, so I think enough Java e, eight news. So there are some uh, uh, some uh, some issues in MVC, but um, oh, issues. Uh, by, um, community has some ideas um, what to extend this MVC. But there is some movement, but uh, from Oracle, it seems like Oracle switched the priorities. And let's see what happens. And um, thankfully, we have JCP. So, um, and JCP is supposed to be transparent. So let's see how it works out. So um, this was the longest introduction to AirHex, but um, we are already in the news section. I would just check out the, um, the chat. So, um, Everything, everything fine. No questions in the Twitters. No questions in the chat. Uh, streaming is working. Perfect. So, now let's start with the very first question. And the, um, and the very, very first question is going to be... Got it. So, we, we covered this uh, dying part. And um, I got another one, and it fits also nice. Is cross-component business transaction and BCE. So I would like to um, to uh, answer it first. And the following. So where's? 
So as I understood the question is the following. As you probably know, um, what I did do, I often re reuse the idea from Ivo Jacobson boundary control entity. And you have one component and this component does something uh, hopefully business related and this component does something else. And the question is, okay, it is fine if one transaction remains in the component, but what happens if the transaction spans multiple components? So how to implement this? Should we move everything to one component? And the answer is simple. Um, it was never meant that way. So um, how it was meant is the following. So what you can absolutely do, you can have here one component, let's say with uh, boundary and control. And here you can have other components. Um, they can have boundary control entity or they just could have just controls and entities. So it really depends whether they are internal or external components. And then what you can absolutely do, this boundary could talk to this one this could talk to this one, or I mean to this one, could talk to this one. And what it shouldn't do, it shouldn't talk to, to, to another boundary. But uh, it could, but it's not that nice. So uh, to answer the question, if you have parallel components, they can absolutely communicate with each other. And because the components are always local, there is no remote communication between them. Um, you can use injection boundary control entity and boundary control entity and they can freely communicate with each other without any problems. So what it actually means, this could call this and this could call even this. So you could have one transaction starting here and spanning these components and if they will all talk to the same database, you get um, uh, absolute uh, transactional behavior. If they talk to multiple databases, then you will get uh, XA and uh, other problems. But uh, from the transactional perspective, it will still work. So I hope the first question is answered. So um, nice. No questions in the chat. No questions in, uh, in Twitter. So next one. Now quick, um, web jars. So, your opinion about web jars and web jars is actually nice. Uh, I don't know whether you know it. There's a project from. Uh, it is like um, it is uh, Bintre and Heroku, and what it is, you can you can access via Maven, <laughs> a major a JavaScript project. They are bundled as Maven, and of course you can deploy it to 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 wars and um, and uh, deliver it from wars. And my opinion about this, so um. Mixed feelings, of course. So, um, if you if you using JSF on whatever you could uh, or MVC, you can uh, absolutely uh, um, um, you could absolutely serve it from your war. But um, if you what we sometimes do, we uh, point to CDNs, and so what it means the, uh, the the scripts do not even exist in our war. Then of course we don't need it. So um, so what it means. It is really nice idea for uh, for I would say enterprise projects where you don't need CDN, so you can just uh, put the jars and and load them. It is not a lots of risk involved because in worst case you can still build your own uh, jar with the JavaScript contents, and this is somehow compatible with JSF. I think components you you were always able to load uh, resources from jars in JSF, and this fits that perfectly. So um, I like the idea. But it's not a general best practice where you should use web jars for everything. But it's a really uh, interesting idea and look at this. Um, so um, if, if you need, and uh, as you can say, use JVM-based build tools, Maven, Gradle, to download your client-side dependencies. So so somehow backwards, right? So we have JavaScript and now we get uh, Maven again to, to fetch JavaScript. But uh, uh, Maven is actually great. Um, dependency has great uh, dependency resolution mechanism, so you can just leverage that. Okay, perfect. So um, this is what I don't know, sample code and your opinion about versioning in REST based on content negotiation. So, and this is also a nice idea. So what you can absolutely do, you can you can add the, um, the version number to the MIME type or to produces, for instance. And then you can ha have multiple methods um, with different, different produces and the framework will pick the, the right version for you. So, um, this is nice from REST perspective, but in my eyes, it's really ugly from Java perspective because what you would 
probably would like to have is to isolation between uh, classes from version 2.3 and classes from version 3. So, um, and what I saw already in production, which was really ugly, they used uh, version names as, as package names, and this is, oh, this is uh, hell on earth, because you get uh, classes with the same names in different packages with different names. And if you develop the application, you will always have closely uh, watched the, uh, the, the package structure, not to confuse classes. So, um, so from RESTful perspective, nice idea. From Java perspective, not that good, uh, I would say. Except um, you know you have uh, you don't have to uh, to switch between classes, or you have different mechanism where you can switch in using, for instance, command pattern qualifiers or whatever to different sets of jars, for instance. Okay, um, let's see. No questions. So what's wrong with you? Two years with uh, of air hacks, and I not a single question. So uh, ask uh, at least uh, how is the weather in Munich or something like this. So next one, um, I mentioned in the year 2010. So it's just crazy, six years ago. Um, and what I wrote is um, it's actually related to my uh, to the to the to the task, and um, that I'm using uh, the uh, max pool size for throttling, and there is a. Um, a few, there, there's a bug in Glasswish Payara which prohibits that. And the question is, what what uh, what uh, Kalidia would like to have is, is uh, exactly billing have some mutation number of concurrent requests is five. It is exactly what we had in our projects. So how to deal with that? And for this reason, look at uh, I just go to my GitHub repository and look at Porcupine. And what Porcupine is, um, you can specify threads at runtime. So where is the configuration? This is not the configuration, this is the monitoring, like here. And you can say max pool size five. And um, if you are using this uh, with, for instance, Jax Arrest, there will be never more than five parallel requests, regardless whether you're using EGB, CDI, or whatever in, in the background. So, and this Porcupine is used as a bulkheads pattern, but is also perfectly capable of throttling. So, look at this. And uh, this is framework, but I think this 10K or something is this really 16Ks. And this is uh, like uh, two classes and a view annotations. So it's not a big deal. You can also just copy the code. So it's not even worth of including the framework here. Okay, so I hope question answered. Perfect. Yeah, um, it would be great if Pyra would fix the error, of course. So um, this is also a recurring question, McFoggy is the plugin mechanism. So uh, do you think, is it feasible using JTE to implement a runtime plugin mechanism uh, system? So what it means is um, something I call deployment. And I would say, I think it is a terrible idea in general. I don't even, I don't even think it's a, it's a good idea to, to do it outside Java E just with plain Java. Why? Because it is really hard in Java to um, unload classes. So, I mean, there is no, no official way of doing this. You can just get rid of all references and hope that the class loader is going to be connect, uh, co garbage collected with all the classes. So, uh, what I would do rather than is implement like uh, something like um, load balancer, for instance, uh, on Docker to be the best one and kill the old version and, uh, and, and start the new one. It's, I think it's called blue-green deployment. So um, this would be the best one, and uh, this is also a safe one. And uh, we did it in um, HA systems and highly available systems, highly critical systems, and it worked perfectly. And it's uh, also simple. And what you get for free then is rolling update. So you can replace even Java at runtime then. Um, um, exactly. So uh, I'm using um, instance for hooks and uh, go to the green book or, or to the green book examples. So if you go to can I, Com. And there is the book, and there should be a plugin sample. So look at the uh, source code, so you don't have necessary by the book. The source code plugins. So a look at the plugins example, and um, you will get it. So this would this would be the idea. Okay, and OSGI. Yeah, um, 
I would say you could use it, but all all major application servers use OSGI anyway, so you already have it. So um, Glassfish is OSGI based, and 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 Whitefell as well. So uh, I don't think OSGI will solve the problem. Um, instance is also runtime injection, but you cannot at runtime in, in in replace classes. So and I got a Twitter question. Perfect. How would you name presentation beans for views in subfolders like uh, full person? So I I need the uh, I I name the beans as the classes. So um, I would I would I would name it uh, person, um, or yeah, just person. If you have of course a person entity, the same, then person view or person presenter. Um, this is um, w what I did, for instance, in the afterburner. So it has nothing to do with JSF, but uh, in JavaFix. So um, I would just start. Um, but I think it is a good idea to name it exactly the same way as the as the XHTML. What he is saying, of course, he has two subfolders, and of course, the person is then no more unique. Then I would call it full person and bar person, for instance, if uh, if there's some business name. Okay. So. Hi Adam, would you rather move from Glassfish 3 to Payara or to Whitefly 9 and why? Good question. So uh, the answer is I would uh, move from Glassfish 3 always to Payara. Why? Because Payara is patched Glassfish and there is actually no migration involved. And uh, from uh, I, I would also, if you, if you would ask me the question, should I move from Whitefly 8 to 10 or to Payara, I would answer always go to from Whitefly to Whitefly because there is nothing to migrate. So if you can, stick with uh, Payara. If you're not, just go to Whitefly. It's not a big deal. It will do, it just uh, it's, it already did it. So we mi migrated some projects from, from, from Glassfish to Whitefly. It was far easier than, 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 than originally assumed. But um, uh, if, you, if you have the choice, stick with Payara. And Payara is great, great support. And yeah. Um, can you point out some good websites to learn about blue-green deployment with Docker? I think it is already implemented. So if you just go to Docker Compose and uh, and uh, user-defined networks, or wait until I I, I release the course. <laughs> um, there is not nothing specific in uh, blue-green deployment, but um, I use uh, at runtime. I just connect and disconnect the host, and if it's if possible at runtime. Uh, so you get your uh, uh, blue-green deployment. And um, uh, most frameworks, like for instance OpenShift, also do this. Um, but yeah, with Docker, it's really not a problem. Just check out user-defined networks in Docker. It's really simple. Uh, and the command should be like, uh, I think, wait a second, Docker network create uh, air hacks, and then uh, Docker uh, network connect air hacks and container name and then all the other all the other uh, container uh, instances will be able to um, ping the container name and on that note just for you it's not announced yet there's another interesting framework in uh, what i created another uh, class framework. You cannot call it framework. We need another name because in Java, e, whatever I created for Java, e, which is repository, usually 7K, one class, two classes, because everything is there. It's called Service Link, and um, the origin name was Urimator. And you won't, you won't believe me where I got the idea for the name. Some of you m may got the idea. So okay, probably it's a little bit too drastic. So I removed, uh, renamed that afterwards to to Service Link. But what it actually does, it works particularly well with Docker. You can inject either legacy links, they are static, or the dynamic links, what I told you about. And then what's pink is, is defined by Docker and really de really depends which Docker container is used. So, and then web target is injected and then you can use your your link. So this is the uh, service link, check it out. Um, I will announce it next week or in two weeks if I have some time. So, thank you for the questions. So let's see. Perfect. So you should be happy. Uh, Alexander should be also happy. And now move on. So we have answered this one. Then, 
I hope it's not greedy if I ask two questions. Absolutely not. Ask me as many questions you like, but don't write me emails because uh, answering a meal email, I actually had to answer a, a semi-business email and it took me 25 minutes to, to know, explain a thing which is really is not possible just to deal with email. So, um, so we want to use a Groovy-based DSL in Java project. So, and, and he asked me, okay, uh, um, is it um, uh, Groovy parses at runtime and access the file system and there are Java e uh, restrictions, is it okay or not? So if you check out an ancient project of me, it was called Greenfire. Let's see whether I find it. Um, perfect. So, as you probably see, it's a Greenfire project. Uh, I hacked a uh, heating control and it was one of the first, I think, Java E5 projects. And I use Groovy for the, uh, for the um, orchestration, so for the algorithm. So exactly what you did right now, I did, when was it? Eight years ago, and it worked perfectly. So the Java E restrictions are, are, are to protect us. And uh, why? Because uh, if you move, for instance, Java E to the Docker container by accident, there's also, you know, this, this you cannot rely on the file system because it's ephemeral, so it could disappear or it's transient. Or if you move Java E to the cloud, it won't also work. So, um, but I use that, so I use exactly what you did. Uh, just look at the green fire. You should still find the sources, but they are ancient. So, um, yeah. 2008. So um, a newer source code this actually was actually a commercial project and um, it was called Anhydrator. So what I did, um, the Anhydrator is like a um, transformation pipeline, it has nothing to do with Java E, it's just a set of Java interfaces, but the interesting part, these interfaces can be implemented with NAS on JavaScript and everything is replaceable. So everything is loaded uh, at startup and everything can be uh, replaced and it's actually used a lot for transformation pipelines. So take a look at this and this is perfectly valid. Of course, uh, um, you don't have to read the scripts from, from the file system. You could also load the scripts as um, class get resource as stream, for instance. Okay, I hope, I hope you are happy with that. So, um, our JE application runs in a network environment where multi and broadcast are forbidden. So I assume something in cloud-like environment. So um, can you recommend any cache implementation that can be used in such environment? I think everything works. So um, this InfiniSpan is based on uh, J groups, and in J groups you can con configure uh, you know IP addresses or broadcast or multicast. The same is true for Hazelcast. So you can either configure the the IP addresses or or use uh, UDP or broadcast. Um, and the application server soon should not matter because the uh, cache implementation is outside the Java standard anyway. And by the way, Web Liberty Profile is really nice application server. So uh, if you have a WLP, um, yeah, enjoy it. There was an interview with Brazil removing a bloat, and, and there was a question um, from uh, or the uh, interviewee said, okay. Um, they remove some bloat by killing DAOs, which is, of course, possible. And um, the this question was answered by the by the author. It was uh, Heliton, so he answered the question. So just read through it. Um, I could just paste it to the chat, and so we'll paste it to here and to the other chat. And uh, yeah, it's his answer. And what he said is, what he used is the entities had um, had um, domain logic, so f uh, behavior, and he injected the entity manager using a thread local, and they were able to access that. And I described this in in the green book, and it seems like it works well in his project. So this was the answer. So and and what is what it implies is that uh, he has a significant amount of business logic within the entities. This is not a common best practice. We do do it. I don't know in three percent of all my projects. So it's not like you know uh, everywhere we we have fat entities. Um, usually we just have the, in the boundary injected entity managers. In the enti entities are still thin, and usually a mix of DTO and entity. So perfect. 
So this is a good one. What is the best uh, approach to generate demo scenarios? So demos are uh, the best shows because the product to clients. And uh, it seems like he needs uh, uh, many entities which are mapped to tables. And uh, my question is, probably something wrong with the design then. Because, um, I mean, what you would like to achieve, right? If the, if the demo is from scratch, then it, it looks like you know prototype then i would just start hacking and and the tables are created for me so it's not a big deal but it looks like his demo is more more specific one like um, domain specific demo so um, like they have a framework and they would like to to have variation of the framework per client to to showcase a specific use case and in this particular case probably um, uh, having type safe entities is not a great idea so uh, um, what you should probably look like is to redesign the tables and 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 just think you know are we interested in something like let's say customer or more like paragraph or table or whatever comes up in the demo so sometimes uh, this is a typical mistake in reports for instance in reports you are not really interested in customers on or addresses or invoices you are more interested in the data behind in the table so i think um, this is not the right abstraction if you have to regenerate all the data layer if uh, something minor changes so i would question uh, do you need type safe entities and um, and at the end i would even question does the database have to be relational? But usually a relational database are really convenient. You get all the support, so, but uh, yeah. And uh, the Java 7 batch processing. So if you would like to have Java 7 batch processing, just look at the anhydrator. Actually, um, a client of, of, of my um, hired me to help them with Java batched, and then we implemented the anhydrator, uh, which uh, is not Java E at all. It's just plain Java 8 without any external dependencies. And it's uh, used actually uh, a lot. And uh, it got already several stars, which I would never think about that it gets so popular. It's just a small utility. I, yeah, I'm not sure whether the question is uh, properly answered, but I hope so. So Victor, I know him. So uh, I don't know whether I know him in person, but uh, from Twitter and from from the for the questions as so uh, a friend of the show. Um, so I want to know in an ear, Warren Jar, can I use uh, jars in the CDI features? You should be able to. Um, and I know it is used, but I know also there are some problems. The so problem is I don't use ear since Java 6, I think 2009, so seven years. Since the inception of, of, of Java E6, everything is war and i let's see what was it uh war is the new year exactly so um i wrote it in 2009 so and um i think um since then i never used ears again so i have to say i have no idea whether it works or not what i only know uh, the, um, there was some problems between dependency injection between war and jars or something like this, but within the jar, it should actually work. Um, I would I would suggest the following: create a prototype. This is what I always do. You know, two classes, see how it works. So now in 2016, developing Portlet is considered in, or should we go JavaScript frameworks plus web services? This is really dangerous to ask such questions to me because um, I, so um, I have a specific relation to potlets and and uh, I have to say I, I never saw the killer use case for potlets in my projects. Um, why not? Why not? Uh, the the portals and potlets were hugely uh, popular back then, a few years ago, or probably even even are. And uh, the, the portal server were bought, but none of the features were used. It's like everyone wanted to have portlets, but non, no, no features were used. You know, inter-portlet uh, communication was barely used. And uh, in one project, they just generated the menu with huge overhead or the uh, mini, um, minimize, maximize, you know, the, the window arrangement, nothing was used. So um, I think um, I would in, uh, invest more in JavaScript for sure. And web services means hopefully not SOAP, REST. So I'm, I have to admit, since I don't know how long, but uh, at least 
five to at least five years, uh, I, I, I have no contact to SOAP. So um, in legacy systems, sometimes we generate once, you know, the, uh, the stops, but we do not emit SOAP anymore. Okay, let's see. No questions here? Um, also no questions here. Very good. Next one. So, um, someone was the Anurada. So, as uh, I wrote an article how to install JDBC driver on Whitefly because I had to do it in a project, and he asked me about uh, how to use UCP JDBC pool data source. Um, I never did it, and I, I, I thought about this. Uh, why you would like to do this? Because. Um, JBoss pulls the connections already for you. So this is actually the, the factory. So what would be the idea behind this? Um, yeah, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. Uh, I have uh, not the killer use case for this, what, what, what the purpose should be. And um, I would try that as I tried with the, with the pool. Probably you can replace something, but I will ask the question uh, in ERC, uh, in Wi-Fi ERC, I, I never had a use case. So, um, and, and for me right now, it would be too time intensive to try to reproduce this because I don't have a, um, a Oracle running on my machine, so I couldn't test it even now. So sorry for this, but if someone from community knows, uh, please help the Anurada. Um, Jay Liakos asked me, let's say we have a custom annotation, my annotation 10, and he would like to change it at the runtime. So how to do this? And thankfully, it was really accident. There's another GitHub project, which I think is really one class and one annotation right now. And this project is very new. Also, um, it uh, it comes in uh, within the... Um, microservices workshop and this is called uh, marina so on what marina is is the um is the client from headlands and now you know marina headlands now you know where i got the idea it was java one two years ago and what headlands is headlands github i don't mean so what headlands is is the rest front end for gsr 107 cache so i using on my server and there's a REST API where you can push and pull data from Jcash. And I use Hazelcast for this, so I get nice clustering. And um, and uh, Marina is able to access that remotely. So, And what you can do then is the following. I can say add in Jcash entry from Headlands. Of course, if it's linked uh, by Docker, it is resolved at the runtime, port 8080, cache configuration key message. And then you get dynamic resolution of whatever you would like from the cache. And this is a remote call. And um, yeah, this is what you could do. Similarly, if you would like to have more availability, there should be JC2. It's a similar one. The main difference is, is the following. So you can inject the strings and they are also fetched from the cache. But in this this time, the cache is local. So if you're using Hazelcast, the cache is replicated. So if the configuration server goes down, this will still work. And in this case, if the configuration server uh, goes down uh, with Marina case, it won't work anymore. Um, so they are the choices, but in both cases, the implementation is trivial. So uh, you don't have to use either of them because I will just show you. It is just very trivial as most of so there are just two. Um, this is the annotation and the configurator is the single class. And it produces it produces a string and long and so forth, but this is the the, the main code. So the, the main uh, the main source code is the, you know the um, obtaining the the um, conventions from the from the annotations. And if you would replace this with a database or property file, so you are set. So you could do whatever you like. And I actually did it, I think. I implemented here somewhere a properties fetch or something. Properties loader. Somewhere there was an example. And it loaded the properties, preloaded the properties at runtime. Yes, here. If you would read the properties here from a database, you would get exactly what you ask for. So I hope the question is answered. 
Okay. So SOA, service oriented architecture. By the way, how to kill a SOA project. Eight year eight years old uh, post what I did back then. I asked, I asked questions, my clients, and then my project get cancelled. Um, or I was cancelled. <laughs> and I asked some project which were not, uh, some questions which were not very convenient. And so so if I see so SOA, I always remember the time. But we have many modules, uh, Country Region Product Division, and uh, he would like to reuse this, uh, she or he um, would like to reuse the modules. And the question is um, how to do this, because if you have a central SOA service or a REST service, it, I would implement, of course, as REST, um, then there is a runtime penalty. And, um, and um, of course, but uh, it is in microservices, what you can always do, you can just duplicate the code. So it's actually considered as best practice, because if teams have to act independently, the code has to be duplicated anyway. So what? And uh, there's also a pattern called bounded context. So what it means is, um, in the uh, microservices architecture, um, you would assume that a country or region in one module is dependent from region in another module. For instance, one region, one module could be interested in the GPS, co GPS coordinates or, or longitude and latitude, and the other, um, other. Um, microservice could be interested more in population and and therefore the region in one microservice would have a population uh, attribute and the other one would have longitude latitude and co color to display it on the map so this is the main idea so um and everything is local the performance is usually surprisingly fast but um what i would do just implement you know the how it's called minimal viable product mvp and test it, stress test it, and, and see whether the performance is good enough or not. And um, I'm not that paranoid about uh, reuse. It usually rarely happens. So um, if you, I would just copy the country region across microservices, see whether there is some common core behavior or common core state. If it is, uh, the question is, is it worth to extracting it? How much time you will save? And the other question is, what will happen if you get the duplication, how likely it is that the country will change frequently and all will affect all modules? So this is these are the questions to ask. Okay, let's see. So no questions here, no questions in the chat. Very good. So um, so we are moving faster and faster. What is your opinion about uh, streams in versus the old connect, uh, collections? And I actually really like streams. And if you go to the Anhydrite project, it was somewhere here, here. So everything here is uh, streams. So, um, and it works perfectly. So I have to say, I really enjoy that. And without streams, the, the whole project would be pointless. It would be so ugly to implement that I think no one would use it. So um, if you have the chance, look at Lambda streams and the functional features from Java with nice IDE support, NetBeans IntelliJ, for instance, you get uh, is really enjoyable, really productive, but don't try to be you know purely functional because you can. So just use streams if appropriate, and you will enjoy it. That's what I can promise you. Um, why? I think I attended. It was three or four years ago. So um, before, of course, Java eight was re uh, released. At Java one, talk about lambdas, and this was the the syntax was not even set. I think they they wanted to use the hashtag, not the um, not the arrow. And um, and I look at the syntax like the, I, I I will never use it. I have no idea what they are what they are doing, what they are what they are talking about, and it really looks strange. But then Java eight came out, and um, I had to use it in a project, and I enjoyed it from day two. So um, what I can tell you, just uh, create a small project like you know, DVD or movie database, and try to play with it, and you would really enjoy it. So and uh, and I would give even a step further. I think with um, with Java eight, uh, the others alternative JVM languages lost their appeal a little bit. While Java eight is just good enough. Okay, so another question. Question about AppSec class interfaces never adequately answered in view of PC. Of course, I always uh, say interfaces and App Store classes are not needed. <laughs> if you see them, try to remove them. If you have a business component that have dependency, how do you handle that? If you have a business component and this is dependency to another component, just inject the class. 
and what is the interface all public methods are the interface so no kidding what 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 my personal opinion meanwhile is and i'm more and more convinced about this is the following in java e interfaces are not needed unless you get two implementation of the interface abstract classes should be avoided unless there is a real need to you find something really great to abstract and I would always do it afterwards. So first write concrete classes, look at the classes over and over again. And then, um, then if you learn more about business logic, then extract uh, the two abstract classes. And this is the reason why I never mentioned them, because in my eyes, abstract classes and interfaces uh, should not be used from the beginning in Java A project. You can uh, introduce them afterwards. And an interface, I'm more explicit. If I see interface in Java E, I would expect a qualifier and command pattern, oh, sorry, uh, strategy pattern or command, but usually strategy pattern. So next question, can I inject an EJB into a JAX Rest interceptor and filter? Of course, if, if so, how can I achieve this? So on that note, I have to uh, show you another, <laughs> another uh, one, uh, one class framework, uh, it's even Procupine is the right one, it's the SPY. And the spy part of Procupine just injects the um, the monitoring data into HTTP headers. If you would like to see it live, uh, check out the microservices uh, workshop. But um, what I did here, I injected um, an instance of statistics, and uh, and it works uh, on all servers out of out of the box. And you could inject uh, if you if this works, you could inject CDI beans, and EGBs are CDI beans, so it should work. In worst case. If it doesn't on your server because um, because of bug or, or or I don't know whether it is even specified, but it always work for me, um, then you could implement a lookup and this will work. So um, GNDI lookup or bin locator lookup, but this works in Wi-Fi. This works in um, in Payara because I use this in projects. Okay. Oh, question from the chat. This is nice. Um, oh. Hi Adam, have you used GWT in JE context? What do you think? Don't ask me please about GWT. I have to say, I really don't like it. Um, it, it reminds me on the old Xtoclet days where you know each change in code took, uh, I don't know, 20 seconds. And GWT is something like this. So um, I would use, yeah, it seems like I still, I still meet developers who are really excited about GWT, but they are in absolute minority. Most GWT uh, developers are cursing about GWT. This is what, what I can tell you. And uh, just go to, to Stack Overflow and search for GWT problems. So if possible, I think I would prefer, no, no, no I would prefer REST with JavaScript frameworks. Um, which one, longer discussion. Angular 2. So if the project is older, you uh, look at uh, Angular 2. And to the others, um, to the other listeners, uh, write to chat whether you l love or hate GWT. I'm really, really interested. What what is the what is your um, opinion about GWT? I have to say um, I don't see the point right now. If look at Vardin, this is um, Vardin. It uses GWT under the hood. Uh, sorry, Vardin. It uses um, uh, GWT um, or GWT after, uh, under the hood, but uh, it's a nice uh, company with support and you don't have to compile, you know, the components over and over again. So, um, yeah, my personal opinion. Um, or is this hard for me to identify a killer use case for GWT? This is what I can tell you. So. Um, and in ECMAScript 2015, this is ECMAScript 6, is the new JavaScript. The JavaScript will look like Java anyway. So I think it will be easier and easier for Java developers to, 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 to use JavaScript if the tooling settles a little bit. Right now with Babel and everything else, a little bit crazy, but it gets better. So the next question I really cannot answer. Um, uh, G. Burand is using P uh, Payara and he gets SOAP exception impl. So I have to say, I, I have no experience with SOAP. I just, in a recent f workshop, someone asked me, you know, to help them with SOAP and client, and uh, we spent 
two two hours and and, and we got more and more code generated and at the end i think even it worked but it was like you know hell on earth and the whole internet was downloaded to 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 to, to invoke one method um i cannot answer this but what i would do is the following go to a payara fish so if you have money ask them uh, they will help you so this is the really the nice guys so uh buy support but if you don't have money then uh, go to here and ask please ask the question again and say greetings from airhex and adam bean probably it will could help so go here and do this and then they, you you should get at least an answer so um okay perfect so uh Steinzak says Java 7 has a lot of features supporting container based security, but there isn't much if you want to manage security directly in your application. Ah, managing. I mean, HTTP basic auth is implemented um, out of the box. Why is that? Um, yeah, because it's not specified. And this is the reason why we have, let's say, uh, Java 8. And what I did is a little bit outdated. Uh, there should be a project. Uh, oh, it's security sex spike so the uh, Aryan teams created uh, built a lot of prototypes with omniface security and to understand this early this year I created um, a small to do app with uh, with the uh, authentication and authorization uh, with basic authentication and uh, we we made it work and Aryan has a lots of um, I cannot find it right now of examples on github Aryan Tims so if you go Aryan Tims I think security github let's see whether we will find him sorry I just misspelled yes perfect so this is uh, the incredibly, um, and there are Java 7 examples. No Java 7 examples, not that. It was um, somewhere. There are lots of examples and he had uh, implemented here um, the security spike where he contributed, but he had lots of uh, just speak and, and authentication ex examples. And just follow him, ping him. And um, probably this is the, the, the Omniface uh, organization, Omni Persistence. There's Omni Security. Just, um, yeah, just watch this. And in Java 8, it's going to be solved. And in Java 7, it was not addressed. So this is the, the truth. But um, so HTTP basic authentication comes out of the box always. So managing is a different story. So managing means you would like to you know, create principles and manage passwords. And for this, I would look at, uh, we had it the last time, I think, key cloak, key cloak and um, from, from Whitefly or OpenAM from, uh, how it's called, Forge Rock, exactly. So they will manage this for you. Because you know, uh, managing means uh, you need password expiration and min length of passwords, and passwords have to contain you know strange characters. So I think we cannot, as a Java eight, shouldn't manage this because I mean, how to standardize that, right? Oh, so architectural questions, component-based UI, GSF tapestry plain how to decide which one front end building strategy to use in the new project a oh, good one this is what i can answer right away how to decide this you have to show the end user the components and the uh, end users will have absolutely committed the components and there should be no project specific extension otherwise uh, you will effectively f uh, um, um, fork the framework particularly what i saw no js eve jsf prime faces were forked because they were not happy with the components not happy they wanted to change the behavior of the components really bad idea um so um this is uh, you know um take it or leave it but not change it this would be my approach to component-based frameworks um how you structure uploaded files in your projects um 
I mean, this very specific question, dedicated file management system, simple folder structure, storing blob in DB. No, I wouldn't store blob in DB, but it really depends which DB it is, right? If it's Cassandra, I will store it. Uh, Oracle uh, or Oracle uh, SQL databases are usually not that good. Um, simple uh, folder structure might might work actually well, uh, so why not? But uh, there are also content management system uh, uh, frameworks which do it right away out of the box. Um, so it really depends on on, on your requirements. What I cr did once. I created a connector which accesses files um, in in transactional way. So um, it was also a specific requirement, and then I created this example afterwards, and it stores it in uh, in, in in folder structure. So um, cache frameworks. Um, what is my opinion about cache frameworks? Don't use them until you have the urgent need to use them. And what I would do first is uh, to de deliver or to test without caching, then uh, me 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 uh, me measure whether the performance is good enough. If it isn't, and the, uh, you have JAXRS um, uh, JAX uh, API, then I would check out reverse proxies like, for instance, um, Varnish or uh, Squid. And if if this is not uh, enough or or you cannot use this, then uh, I would look something like Hazelcast or Infinispan, for instance. Have you ever used NoSQL database in my project? Yes. Uh, definitely need to use NoSQL database. Yeah, uh, definitely. If, for instance, you uh, you look at the table and you get a lot of key value pairs in your table, because uh, uh, um, the, your entities are, are changing frequently, it was we get a qu related questions right now. And with NoSQL databases, what's uh, what's advantage is new object can have more attributes than the older one. And uh, what it basically means is uh, you don't have to to alter the schemas. And funny enough, the main reason why we got NoSQL database in project is because the older table in the relational database was too so, so slow then we couldn't implement continuous deployment because the database was too big. So the uh, main driver was actually the performance of all the table. And look at your uh, relational table. If you are have to work with key value pairs anyway, I think uh, NoSQL might be beneficial. Um, so if I would like to, to, uh, to notify users about something real time, what would I use? Uh, WebSockets, of course, first. Um, and uh, all applications have implement uh, WebSockets, so this was my first choice. We used Atmosphere in the past because application servers were not capable of have long polling with uh, or efficient long polling with JAXRS, so we use Atmosphere framework for this. And Atmosphere was actually based on 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 Grizzly and Glassfish v2 or v3. So, um, so I would use web. I would start with WebSockets. Uh, RabbitMQ could be interesting. Uh, and, and Ajax is a workaround, because if WebSockets are not um, supported, then I would use long polling or Comet. I know you don't work, I know you don't work with Spring. I mean, no one asked me to work with Spring, so um, I, I really have to say it's like, yeah, I just don't use it because th there is no need. So I just don't see Spring in my projects. About Spring versus Java stacks. Oh, what I can tell you, so, um, they are very similar, so you can, um, but you shouldn't mix them. So you can just deploy Spring on Jetty, and it is similar to Java. So um, uh, when you are starting a new project, how to decide go with plain Java stack or with Spring? Yeah, look on your client. Do they have application server already in place? Then use Java. If they, if if your team is now uh, the just comprising Spring fanboys, just use Spring. So you shouldn't convince this. It's really hard to convince Spring. Or now it's easier. But a few years ago, it would be impossible to convince uh, Spring guys to use Java. Meanwhile, uh, they are so similar that uh, a reasonable Spring guy will probably use Java without any problems. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't force anything. So um, And in my project, it looks like we have already Java application servers everywhere. So it would be you know, uh, unreasonable to introduce Spring, which run on application servers, because you get you know, uh, two frameworks which are too similar to each other. So a session exploration in JSF. Um, so there's a nice way. And I think Prime Faces comes with expiration something. What is it? Prime Faces. 
expiration. Uh, not session expires, there's um, how it's called inactivity, inactivity. And there is a nice component. Idle monitor, exactly. I had it recently. And this, if I do nothing, for five seconds, which is a long time during a live show, you see, um, what are you doing over there? So no activity. So um, what you should do, the session should expire on the server, but uh, you could detect it on the client and just do something with it. You, could, um, uh, you get uh, uh, an AJAX event which can, could invalidate the session or redirect it somewhere. And there are enough examples. Actually, um, you could use filter to redirect if the session is expired. And uh, if you get uh, exceptions on a session expiration, they can be also rerouted to a, to a login page using the WebXML uh, deployment descriptor. Okay, so, oh, Twitter. Uh, are you using Delta Spikes in the Java 7 project? Yes, I use, Thomas Kenstock asked me, uh, I use Delta Spike, yes, I'm using Delta Spike uh, uh, a lot for um, testing. First, if you look at the examples, even I think this JC2 and uh, and the other one, uh, Sex Spike, I think, I use Delta Spike for testing because it's easier to set up than Archelian, so it's really transparent. It's not as, as powerful as Archelian. What you cannot do with Delta Spike, you cannot... Now, you have to look, check out the, um, the uh, how it's called, uh, Java e testing workshop. So I, I use Delta Spike. So, um, but I don't use Delta Spike in production because there is no need to use it. It's a similar discussion like with Spring. It's like, yes, if I will need, you know, the, the see the urgent, um, the urgent, uh, the, the urgent need or something is lacking, I would use absolutely data spike. But right now I see the killer feature is testing, just, uh, integration testing for specific purposes like uh, technical libraries. Just look at my GitHub account, but not in production. Oh, I missed a question from the chat. James Gosling left Java company. Yeah, but I don't think he, he, he left Java company. So James Gosling is absolutely working with Java right now and is, and is creating uh, robots, which looks like surf, uh, surfboards. So, um, and Rod Johnson is working uh, with Scala right now. Okay, so I think, yeah. All questions answered, um, I hope. Yeah, someone suggests me Marionette.js. So uh, thank you for watching and thank you for asking me for two years uh, Java E related questions. Um, crazy, really crazy uh, how short two years actually are. And I'm curious um, how long we will talk about Java E related questions here. And uh, what I can tell you, we get more and more live uh, 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 attendees. So the last time there were way over 100. And afterwards, there's of course uh, a few thousand uh, uh, views on YouTube. So this time, I will uh, uh, submit this um, the show later because um, I will start with um, uploading the uh, microservices workshop. And yeah, thank you for watching, and see you at workshops in Munich. So come to in April or in summer, and ask me. But then prepare questions because the whole workshop is just based on questions. So I have a few slides and IDE. I'm just waiting for questions and hacking with you whatever you like. So thank you for watching and see you soon.